We're looking at Acts chapter 2. Very, very familiar, very familiar passage. Um, but we're going to begin reading at verse 41. And what we find is this. Then those, speaking of the early church, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And by the end of the first century, there were estimated to be over or about 300,000 Christians. And they met throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and primarily worshiped together and met in homes, house churches, if you will. And if you think back, God in his wisdom established the church through his son Jesus. And churches have become places of fellowship, families of believers, uh, places where non-believers can become believers, where believers can be challenged and encouraged in their, in their walk of faith. However, throughout the centuries, people have criticized the church. Lots of complaints have been made about the church of Jesus Christ. And they generally come in three forms. One is that the argument that the church is antiquated. The church is antiquated. It doesn't address the real needs of modern society. Or it's outdated. No longer viable. After all, they... The people in churches, they, they, they follow a, as a guide a book that's centuries old. And, and many say filled with fables. These are the arguments we hear against the church. It's antiquated. Have you heard that? Have you ever heard that from someone? I have. And I'm sure. I, I've even heard it from people in the church. Sadly. And then another argument, the one we hear from Hollywood often, is that, well, church is just a crutch. Religion is just a crutch. This is something for weak and unstable people. Or, or a harbor for people who are afraid of life and, and more importantly, afraid to die. Some say church is like a lioness blanket for those who can't handle life. Have you heard that argument? Sure. We've heard it all, haven't we? The one that we hear the most probably is, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Never heard that one, have you? The church is full of hypocrites. The critics will always find the negative, right? I mean, people who are critical of the church are going to always point out the hypocrites, are always going to point out the ones who have fallen, the ones who have made mistakes and gotten caught. They never look at the good that's been done by the church. They never look at the good that's been done in lives, in, in lives that have been improved through the ministries of the church. 
church is full of hypocrites. And that's exactly where the hypocrites need to be, right? In church. So then why are people so critical of the church? There are some reasons, I believe. First of all, some people are critical of everything. They're going to be critical no matter what. That's just their nature to be critical. Secondly, people are critical because Satan doesn't like the church. And he'll use anybody who will give him the opportunity to, to hurt the church. The third reason that we often won't admit is that churches really do have problems. Churches are not perfect. That's because churches are full of people and people aren't perfect. And, you know, if you ever find a perfect church, let me know. It don't exist. It doesn't exist here in this world. There's no such thing. Churches, as long as they're full of people, will be imperfect. But church should not be a place for those who are perfect. Church is a place for people who are hurting. Church is a place for people who, who need encouragement, who need to grow in their faith. People who've been bought with the blood of Jesus, but people who need to grow in their faith. So if church has all these problems, and, and really it doesn't, you don't have to go far to find a critic of the church. And I'm not talking about any specific denomination, but any church and any representation of, of God uh, through an assembly of people, you don't have to go far to find a critic. And sadly, more often today, we are seeing churches that are closing their doors. We are seeing churches that are, that are unable to continue going. We are seeing churches that are dying out. As their members die, there are no younger members coming along to replace them. So why... Should the church matter to us? Why should we believe in the good of the church? Well, the first reason is because the church has been bought with a price. The church has been bought with a price. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we read these words. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the pastor. It doesn't belong to the deacons. It doesn't belong to the members. It belongs to God. The church is his. He bought it with the blood of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. What love Christ had for the church. Christ loved the church. He gave himself for the church. If the church is that important to him, it should be important to us if we are his followers. A few years ago, a Christian writer, Tula Jeffries, wrote this. She said, a key to a good relationship in marriage is in establishing priorities. What is important to one spouse has to become important to the other. We must care about what our spouse cares about. When Christ gave his life for the church, he was saying, I love you. I care about the church. What a testimony. 
the church matters to Christ. And when we join the church, we're making a statement that we are associating ourselves with Christ. Because he loves the church, we too love the church. The one organization for which Christ was willing to die. So the church matters to him. And it should matter to us. So why do we believe in the church? We believe in the church because it matters enough to Christ that he was willing to die for it. Secondly, the church was birthed with a purpose. The church was birthed with a purpose. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And if you skip down to verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. There are five purposes of the church. Five primary purposes. Worship. Evangelism. Fellowship. Ministry. And discipleship. Worship. Evangelism. Fellowship. Ministry. Discipleship. And all five of these things were happening in the first century church. The church we read about in the second chapter of Acts. See, God doesn't lead us to a church by accident. We are all here for a purpose. We are here because this is where God has led us. He puts together a, a patchwork, if you will, of, of talents, of, of dreams, of abilities and gifts. And he uses all of those to do ministry through the church. So what is it that God has put you here to do? There certainly is a purpose. Do you know what it is? Are you allowing him to use you for that purpose? What does he want you to do? And if you're not fulfilling your purpose, ask God to reveal to you what it is he wants you to do. And then do it. Just get to work doing it. The church is birthed with a purpose. But also, the church is the bearer of precious news. We're the spiritual descendants of those who were gathered at Pentecost in Jerusalem. Those we read about in the second chapter of Acts. Peter's first action after the coming of the Holy Spirit was to tell other people about Jesus. Now, how many people were gathered there? Who knows? Go back to chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number, of, the number of names was about 120. Then he preached. So there were about 120 people gathered. And how many were there after he preached? Verse 41 in chapter 2 says... Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. What purpose? Wow. What purpose? This is the same purpose for which we've been called. And we do it through the church primarily. We, we're equipped. We're trained through the church. And it's kind of like the, the, the ripples when you throw a pebble in the water. How they just continue to expand. Those few, the, the 120, it just 
continue to grow into today millions of believers throughout the world. And we've been called to be a part of that, sharing that good news, of helping to see that kind of growth, that exponential growth that comes along when we share the good news of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to do our part. We've got to tell the good news of Jesus. So we should believe in the church because the church was bought with a price. The church was birthed with a purpose. The church is a bearer of precious news. And finally, the church is a bride in preparation. Jesus likened his return to a bridegroom coming for his bride. And we see this in the Revelation in chapter 21. Verses 1 and 2. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Jesus makes it clear. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for the church, and she will be without spot. She'll be without wrinkle. She'll be without blemish. The Bible gives us instructions, if you will, of how believers are to live as we await his return. Our responsibility is, as, as we await his return is to, to be his voice, to be his hands, to be his feet, his representatives, in other words, in this world. We are to be prepared ourselves, first of all, but then we're to help other people get prepared for his return. Now the church, it's not perfect. None of them are. But the church is the agency through which Christ chose to bring about redemption. At least until he returns. And we're with him. 